One of the tools that evolutionary biology has developed is called molecular phylogenetics. It's a way of reconstructing history by looking at DNA sequences. And in cancer biology, it is used to reconstruct the history of a cancer within an individual patient. Let's take a look at how that's done. What we learn is that the evolutionary history of a cancer within the patient can be much longer than we thought it was. When we look into these phylogenies, they can show convergent evolution. That means that different branches adapt in similar ways independently of each other. That's a signal that selection's going on. The heterogeneity that is then revealed by the study of these phylogenies points out that there are problems for therapies that might be based on a single sample. So they're kind of ground truthing the set of facts that we need to treat cancer. When we look into the way that tumors actually move, spread, metastasize within the brain of a single individual, it shows that multiple clones survive and they occupy different positions in the brain. And that means that chemotherapy is not just selecting the single most resistant clone, it's selecting a set of clones that have different properties, which means that genetic diversity survives and is available for the next round of chemotherapy and can defeat it. Then finally, we're going to look at a fairly advanced statistical analysis of phylogenetic trees. And by using that, we will see how we can assess how effective therapy is, because we can see bursts of evolution going on before, but not after, the therapeutic intervention. So let's take a look first at pancreatic cancer. Now, pancreatic cancer is something that we usually think of as killing people pretty quickly. Um, I had a friend uh, in 1987 who got his diagnosis on the 1st of January, and he was dead by Easter. Now, here is an analysis that was done uh, of the metastases in a patient who had died. And there were three different metastases. They sequenced the cells in each one, and from the DNA sequences, they were able to reconstruct how long ago those cells had shared a common progenitor. From that, they were able to deduce that the tumor had initiated 18 or 20 years before the patient died, had expanded for about 10 years, then the metastatic subclones that developed out of the pancreas and moved into other kinds of tissues, they had actually moved into those tissues five or six years before diagnosis. And in this case, the patient was diagnosed and lived for about three years after diagnosis. That's a very important insight because it means that if we could detect these non-metastatic primary tumors, we might be able to treat the cancer before it becomes dangerous. This is the same case, the same data. So what you see here is a progression from normal duct epithelial cells in the pancreas to the first step of a tumor cell that can grow. That leads to a parental clone which can expand. Then there are subclones with metastatic capacity, and then they move into lung, liver, and liver. The index lesion, the one that the oncologist picked up and said, oh my goodness, this guy has cancer, was in the liver. So what's going on here? Well, there's a period of about 12 years here of clonal selection that's going on. Then, with metastasis, there is an escape from the local resource limitation of the pancreas, and cells can move out and colonize other organs. The diagnosis comes too late, and when the patient finally dies, and we look at the metastases in lung and liver, we discover local adaptation. They've changed. The metastases moving into lung cells have become more like lung cells, and the metastases moving into liver have become more like liver cells. In a case, another case, of, in, this, in, in this case it's acute lymphoblastic leukemia, the variation in the clones was not linear with a dominant clone. These are from one cancer patient 
And what you see here are the number of copies of the gene. So there, there are different gene names here. This clone here has two copies of RUNX1. This one has three copies of that gene, and so forth. You can work through it if you want. No single clone replaced all of the others. And there was repeated loss of copy number variants. So you shouldn't think necessarily of clonal evolution in cancer as being one where there is a winner that takes all. In fact, there are cases in which at any point, there can be quite a few different clones that are surviving. Now here is a case of renal carcinoma, and I'm going to go through two or three slides of this because this was quite well analyzed, and it shows how evolutionary divergence poses some real problems for therapy. Here is a picture of that renal carcinoma, okay? And you can see that it con contains a lot of subclones. G is indicating tumor grade. So this is a grade one tumor here. This is a grade six tumor here. And these clones are scattered all over uh, the surface of this kidney. This sample was taken out of a kidney right here. The metastases went into the chest wall and into the lung. There was also one that was just next to the kidney. So the biopsies are usually taken out of the primary tumor. And that was on the kidney in this case. Subsampling of the primary tumor showed that there was all of this clonal heterogeneity just there in this part of the cancer. If you look at these different samples, okay? So these are different parts from the kidney. This is the chest wall sample. Uh, this is uh, a couple of other metastases. And you look at the genes that are uh, ubiquitous. So they're in all the cells or they're just in the primary tumor or they're shared by the metastases or they're private to single little branches in the metastases. Basically what you see here is a gray indicates that the mutation is present. A blue indicates that mutation is absent. The purple gene names here is that shows that they validated it. And the orange gene, gene names in a few little cases show that they failed to validate the gene. Okay, so that's showing the reliability of the information. The take home on this is that if you design a therapy to treat the primary tumor here, that is going to miss variation in the metastases over here. And if you design a therapy to treat one metastasis, it's going to miss the, what's characterized here as the private variation that is cropping up in each individual metastases. This is the same data. And basically, this is showing the phylogenetic tree of that renal cell carcinoma, where we have in blue the mutations that are found in normal tissue and are ubiquitous. Then we have shared primary mutations here. We have shared metastatic mutations here. And then there are some primary, uh, some private mutations that crop up. And in the metastases, there are several private mutations. That means just found on that one last little twig. The take home from this is that we may need to treat the branches, not the twigs. And in any event, we need to have this level of detail to try to figure out what is going to cause resistance to chemotherapy in a metastasizing cancer. Now let's take a look at another case. This is a similar kind of process. I think you're beginning to get the idea that cancers look like phylogenetic trees. Here's the phylogenetic tree of a glioblastoma. That is the commonest kind of brain cancer. The founding clone then split off and it formed different kinds of tissues in different parts of the brain. So it was possible to trace the ancestor-descendant relationships through this and see which kinds of tissue were proneural and which kinds of tissue were mesenchymal. This is a 
section uh, through the brain, this is a scan through the brain, where you can see where a piece of the brain was taken out to try to control the tumor. The resection was done there. Now, the population that survived, the population of clones that survived, wasn't a single resistant clone, but again, it was multiple clones that had different mutations for resistance. Unless treatments eliminated all clones, the survivors would persist and they would possibly flourish. Now let's take a look at a case where a fairly sophisticated statistical reconstruction of evolution gave some insight into the efficacy of therapy. These are esophageal adenocarcinomas, and uh, these are for different individuals. So this is one individual here. That's the phylogenetic tree of that cancer in that individual. These are sample numbers. This is another individual with its phylogenetic tree and so forth. The dashed gray line right here, and right here, and right here, and right here, indicates when therapy was begun with a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. So that would be something like naproxen, or perhaps a statin. And what you can see in at least three of these cases is that evolution was faster and was producing a much more diverse array of clones before the NSAID therapy came in, and that the therapy appears to have killed off a whole lot of lineages. There are some surviving lineages, but you can see that in fact the therapy is greatly decreasing the genetic diversity of these clones. And you may recall for Barrett's esophagus it was shown that the greater the genetic diversity, the more likely the progression to malignant cancer. So this is a way of using phylogenetic reconstruction and Bayesian inference to see whether or not a particular kind of therapy was effective. And in this case, it showed that it was relatively effective. If we take that same data and we present it another way, this is now, on the x-axis, the log of the somatic genetic alteration rate, okay, so that you can think of that as the mutation rate. It includes copy number variants. These are the individuals in rows here, and what we see are the rate of somatic genetic alteration when they are on the NSAID and when they are off it. So we can infer from that, on average, that using these drugs reduced the rate at which there were somatic generation, uh, genetic alterations about tenfold. That is a very neat kind of use of molecular phylogenetics to understand the efficacy of cancer therapy. So to summarize, the evidence that cancer is clonal evolution is now basically overwhelming. Cancers originate in the bodies of patients earlier than expected, and when they did, can be estimated if we can recover samples. Single biopsies of primary tumors are seriously underestimating the clonal heterogeneity of the metastases, and therefore are giving misleading information on the potential efficacy of treatment. We need to tr be able to somehow treat the entire tree not just a single branch, because the other branches will survive. And phylogenetic inference is also a tool that allows us to assess how effective particular therapeutic interventions have been.